gender equity and happy to have everyone uh, join us today um, to uh, start our topic for the winter and fall, which is safety in all of its forms. And we're happy to have um, Dr. Patricia King um, here with us today to talk about work that she's done with the Federation of State Medical Boards on um, medical regulation and, um, and physician um, sexual misconduct. So, and I'll, I'll introduce Dr. King in a little bit more depth in a second, but I wanted to um, give the floor to Dean Page for a second. One of the things that I really appreciate about Dean Page and our other senior leaders is that they're showing up. They show up at all of these sorts of events and learn alongside all of us um, in the vein of cultural humility. And so, um, Dean Page, I'll give you the floor for a moment. Thank you so much, Dr. Doherty. And I, I, you, you hit the nail on the head, absolutely. Um, um, it's a pleasure to attend these sessions. You and the group do such a terrific job. And, and uh, you, in, in your role as Director of Gender Equity, through the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion have done such a great job in putting this series together and, and, uh, and providing learning for all of us. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, and social justice are, are critical to our college. And, um, and your series specifically with your focus on gender equity fits with uh, the priorities of our college, our updated uh, strategic plan, Vision 2025. I'll get it right, there we are. Uh, which um, has been updated to specifically focus on the fundamental um, foundation of diversity, equity, and inclusion within our college, as well as, as with new object objectives in all of the domains of our strategic plan. So with that, I look forward to sitting back and listening to the distinguished Dr. King and uh, the rest of this session today. So I'll pitch things back to you, and, and thanks again for your leadership and the, the leadership of your group on this uh, series. Wonderful. So I do have a number of um, administrative nuts and bolts to throw at everyone while I have a captive audience. Um, I want to let everyone know that our next gender, educate, gender equity education series session is um, an in-person event. It is um, put on by the safety team a local nonprofit um, comprised of women who are primarily black belts of multiple degrees, really skilled martial artists, um, who are going to be teaching about how to empower yourself to create safety. Um, and some of it is conceptual and some of it is hands-on self-defense. It's a really neat um, presentation that we're getting to bring um, to the um, to Larner College of Medicine and the UVM Medical Center. It is by RSVP only because the, it's limited. Please email um, Emily Imarino um, at the email below, and I'll also have her put it in the chat. Um, for more information. So please join us for that. Um, a couple of other things, there are nominations for our Celebration of Gender Equity in Medicine and Science Awards that are due this Friday by 5 p.m. Um, so please think about honoring um, a colleague, a mentee, a mentor um, for one of these special awards. Um, next, the Women in Medicine Peer Leadership Group, this is a cohort-based professional development group that we've run twice before in the past. We're going to do our third iteration starting um, next week. Um, if you're interested in registering for this group, um, if you're interested in developing leadership skills with networking with faculty from across the institution, um, please go to the link that Emily is going to put in the chat now and sign up for that group. It's the third Thursday of each month from 530 or excuse me, from 330 to 5. Um, and it will be in person um, at the medical school. Um, lastly, we do have a listserv. We're trying to increase uh, our ability to communicate with folks. Um, so we do have a listserv that you can sign up for. So again, Emily's going to put that in the chat. Just click on that, add your email address, and we'll make sure that you get information on all of the events. 
So with all of those nuts and bolts pieces out of the way, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Patricia King. Um, she's a board certified internal medicine doctor. She's a professor emerita of medicine at the Larner College of Medicine, and she's also a fellow alum of the Larner College of Medicine. And we brought her here today because she's a content expert on medical regulation, and this involves the licensing of physicians and other providers to practice medicine in a safe and professional manner. Um, Dr. King has served as a chair or member of the Federation of State Medical Boards, uh, Board of Directors from 2014 to 2020, and is a current board member of the Federation of State Medical Boards uh, Foundation. She was a member of the Vermont Board of Medical Practice from 2003 to 2015 and served as chair from 2010 to 2014. So a lot of leadership around professional practice here. Specifically, Dr. King was the chair of the FSMB's work group on physician sexual misconduct and has presented the work group's recommendations nationally to individual state medical boards and to medical professional insurance entities. She also chaired the FSMB's work group on education about medical regulation for medical students and residents. She was on the advisory board for the Greenwall Project, which was a project out of WashU, a study of best practice for state medical boards investigation of egregious physician misconduct. She was a contributor to the American Board of Medical Specialties and the NBME Proceedings Paper on Advancing Assessment of Professionalism in Continuing Certification. And she currently serves on and chairs the US MLE uh, Legal Ethical Task Force. Her CV goes on. I'd like to have her be able to say a few words. So I'm going to pass the mic along to Dr. King. So please join me in inviting our own Dr. Patricia King to the virtual podium. Thank you so much, um, Anne, for that wonderful um, introduction. And to Dr. Page also for your great support of the Gender Equity Series. It's very important for leadership to be involved, and it's great to have you here. So as, as Anne said, I was the chair of the, I'm just gonna say FSMB because Federation of State Medical Boards is, takes a, a lot more time. So I was chair of the FSMB's work group on physician sexual misconduct. And I um, actually, during my chair year, we started this group and it went on for two years before the final recommendations were presented to the House of Delegates at our annual meeting of all the state medical boards in the, in the US and the US territories. Um, these recommendations are for state boards. So um, that is the perspective that you will hear, but they all really apply to medical practice and in particular, the aspects of public protection and trust. And I began the title with public protection and trust public trust just to emphasize that important part of professionalism, as I know that that is one of the pillars of the medical school. Um, as Anne mentioned, I have presented this multiple times to multiple individual boards, California, New York, and others, um, North Carolina. I've also presented um, to larger um, webinars for the state, for all of the state medical boards as well as insurance groups, a couple of insurance groups. This is the first time I've presented to an academic group. So it'll be interesting to hear your questions and I look forward to your um, discussion afterwards. So on the next slide, I just wanted to briefly touch on the um, objectives that I made for this presentation. I'm gonna give you a little bit of information about state medical boards and their roles. Um, and I will give you some data on complaints to state medical boards, and then also talk about the history of physician sexual misconduct and the history of regulatory boards for addressing this to give you some context to where we were in 2017 and where we had come from. Another um, objective will be for you to understand the process of the work group. We tried to be very inclusive and um, really far reaching. 
to understand the role and process of medical boards in investigating a complaint and the recommendations of the work group related to this process and specifically um, on the subject of physician sexual misconduct. And then finally, I wanna tell you what our state boards are doing to implement um, these recommendations. So on the next slide, in 2017, this is, these were the headlines across the country. Um, in the summer of 2016, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which is the Atlanta major newspaper, did an expose, a series of articles on physicians and sexual abuse. And it received a lot of attention and also really was quite critical of state medical boards, um, more, some more than others, but yet really kind of put out the, the message that state boards were not always doing what they should do in terms of um, allowing people who had abused patients to continue practicing. Um, immediately following this, in the, that was in the summer of 16, in the fall of 17 um, was the news broke on Larry Nasser and his abuse of multiple gymnasts with the US gymnastics team. At, that was at Michigan State. And following that, or in no particular order, um, was Richard Strauss at Ohio State. He worked at the student center and abused multiple male um, athletes and students at Ohio State. There was also Dr. Tyndall at USC, who um, was found guilty of abusing multiple students at the USC Student Center. And um, additional um, cases not listed on this was Dr. Robert Haddon in New York City, who um, abused many, many um, uh, patients at Columbia. And actually there was an article in the New York Times about him just two days ago, because he is now being charged in federal court after the civil suits, after the state suit, and now he's again in, in court um, on federal charges. And then one other that isn't on here, but I'd like to add because it's, it really demonstrates an important point I'll talk about later, was Dr. Cruciani, who was at Drexel just maybe two years ago, I think, and was accused of abuse of patients and lost his license that started really in New York City a number of years before, then occurred in New Jersey, and then when he moved to Drexel, he was exposed and um, lost his license at that time in all of those states. So the next state, the next slide, um, I just want to take a few minutes to tell you about the function of state boards. And this is very simplistic, but state medical boards by statute, there is a statute in each state establishing the state medical board and also establishing their basic functions, which are licensure, discipline, and regulation. Licensure is um, pretty straightforward. The state board is responsible for evaluating each applicant's fitness, and that includes their education, that they have graduated from a medical school, a certified medical school, and accredited medical, medical school, that they've completed graduate education training, and that they've passed national testing, whether that's the United States Medical Licensing Exam, the USMLE, or the COMLEX exam. The second major role of state boards is discipline. The state boards receive complaints from patients and from family members and others um, against individual physicians, and then they investigate those complaints, take appropriate action when indicated and may take action against a physician's license for unprofessional incompetent or the unlawful practice of medicine. And then finally, the boards have some role in regulation by establishing standards for physician licensure and practice, including policies such as pain prescribing policies to strengthen physician practice. So on the next slide, I've got some data that I thought you might be interested in. Um, and this shows the complaints and the board actions across the country in 2021. 
So each one of the state boards, um, when they do take a complaint to a board action, whether that would just be a recommendation for continuing education or a suspension of the license, but those are all sent in to the, um, the National Practitioner Data Bank and also sent in to the um, Federation of State Medical Boards. And these data really reflect um, the information that the, that the Federation receives from all the state boards. So in the country, there are a little over a million licensed physicians. That includes both, both MDs and DOs. Almost 85% are certified by ABMS or an AOA specialty board. All toll, all of the state boards together receive about 80,000 complaints um, a year in total. Um, and that can range from just a few to quite a few. You can imagine the difference, actually the difference between Vermont and New York State is very significant just by virtue of the population. Of those 80,000 complaints to state boards, about 7,200 um, disciplinary actions result. Uh, and those disciplinary actions are legal documents. They are sent to the Federation of State Medical Boards headquarters, as well as to the MDP, National Practitioner Data Bank. And those, those 7,200 actions really represent only about 3,400 physicians um, in two, two, 2021. And this has been fairly constant for the last number of years. Um, so those 3,400 physicians are about 0.3% of the licensed populations. And it's less than the, the number of actions because several physicians have more than one complaint or they might have actions in more than one state if they have licenses in multiple states. So this is a really small number and that is the good news. I should say it's not a small number, but it's a small percentage. And that's the good news about our profession. Over time and in total, about 4% of the physician population has been disciplined in the US. So on the next slide, then we see what those disciplinary actions involve. Each action, the le each legal document that comes into the Federation um, is categorized based on the conclusions of law in the legal document. And those general categories of conclusion of law are shown here. So quality of care is 35%, miscellaneous 28%, general 23%. You can scroll down to professionalism is 15%, controlled substance violation and, and on. One thing I want to point out here is that many of these terms are very vague and not very descriptive. And that has been a criticism of state boards that certainly was sounded in the Atlanta Journal article, but in many other publications um, is the lack of transparency in these legal conclusions of law. And just to look more closely at professionalism, because that's what we're going to be talking about today, the next slide breaks down that category in a little bit further um, based on the conclusions of law. So unprofessional conduct, which is not not terribly transparent, sexual misconduct, much more so, moral unfitness, unethical conduct, again, a bit vague, failure to use proper diligence in professional practice, sexual boundary violation, physician patient boundary issue. There's a lot of redundancy and there's a lot of vagueness. And that was one of the um, issues that we wanted to address. So on the next slide, um, I'm just giving you some data from a publication by Jim Dubois and his colleagues in the ethics department at the University of Washington in St. Louis. And they wanted to really look at more information about these cases that were vaguely described in the legal documents. So they analyzed 101 cases of physician sexual misconduct over a time period of, I believe it was 2000, Eight to 2015. So, and these are the characteristics that um, their analysis brought forward. 
94% of the cases involved physicians in non-academic practices. They were in private practice. In this 101 cases, all of the abusers were men, but that is not always the case. But in this, in this cohort, it was. 92% were greater than 39 years old and 70% did not have board certification. The victims in 89% of the cases were women and there were five or more victims per abuser in 57% of the cases. And just some other characteristics of the cases, 88% um, of the cases had more than one type of professional wrongdoing. 96% of the cases had repeated sexual abuse. 30% of the cases had a duration of abuse in the main workplace of greater than five years. 85% of the cases um, showed that patients were examined alone. And in 27% of the cases, there was missed opportunity for whistleblowers. The most severe breaches are preceded by lesser or more subtle actions of misconduct as a general finding. And I think the big takeaway that Dr. Dubois would want all of you to have is that early intervention is absolutely critical, that people who abuse often are, there are multiple people involved over multiple years, and multiple instances. So multiple, multiple, the earlier the intervention occurs, the more effective our public protection will be. And the other point that I'll bring up later on is, is, is the bystander and the duty to report um, because 27% in this cohort had a missed, op missed opportunity to intervene earlier. So the next slide then, just I wanted to give you a little bit of history, to think about the history of, of sexual misconduct in medicine from the perspective of the profession. I think historically, and we have here since the time of Hippocrates, sexual relations between a physician and a patient were considered unethical. But when you look at the laws and professional rules against sexual relationships, it was only in the 1970s that these became um, present when there was greater awareness of the prevalence of physician sexual misconduct. And the prevalence studies in the late 80s and the early 90s demonstrated sexual relationships in as many as 10% of therapeutic relationships. And it, it wouldn't be hard to imagine, or I'm sure many of you um, who have been in medicine for a long time, um, lived through a time when there might have been minorities, and there were minorities of physicians in different areas that did not deem all sexual contact with patients to be unethical. And certainly in an academic setting, um, didn't deem um, sexual relationships between faculty and students or faculty and residents to be unethical, which is what we believe now. On the next slide then, um, I just, show some particular dates um, in our history um, for the profession of medicine. In 1973, the American Psych Psychiatric Association became the first major medical organization to explicitly prohibit physician-patient sexual conduct contact as part of its ethical code. And in 1991, which wasn't, you know, 30 years ago, not that long ago in the history of medicine, that the AMA explicitly condemns sexual misconduct. And then in 1992, the Psychiatrist Association prohibited um, or extended that prohibition or pro prohibition to any former patients as well as current patients. So the next slide shows the medical regulatory initiatives that were taking place alongside all of these changes in the viewpoint an opinion of the medical profession. Um, the Federation started educational pro programming in sexual misconduct by 1988, um, and that paralleled a stronger and more consistent response to sexual misconduct and calls for that to occur. In 1993, the Federation began a series of workshops on sexual misconduct involving 
um, the board attorneys, investigators, and other board staff. And in 2006, the Federation's House of Delegates adopted a policy on how to handle physician sexual boundary violations. And this was another work group um, that had been convened just prior to 2006. And, and following that, there were several educational opportunities that the Federation put forward for medical boards. But in 2017, after the Atlanta Journal Constitution article and following many of the um, public awareness of these very egregious cases, um, we convened a new work group to revise, to, to, re, to look again at our 2006 policy and to look at um, how this needed to be updated to 2017. And those recommendations are what I'm going to talk about today. They were adopted unanimous, unanimously at our 2020 House of Delegates. So the next, um, on the next slide, this was the what, why, and how of our work group. The what, um, again, as I said, was to develop best practice guidance and recommendations to our state board regarding the investigation and judification of complaints of physician sexual misconduct. We, we started out with an idea that we would update the 2006 guidelines, which, which were good guidelines for the time, but in 2020, it was clear that they needed to be completely redone. And then finally, we had an aspiration in 2017, 18, to really look at changing culture across the continuum of medicine and how could our work contribute to that change. Our whys included um, really addressing the egregious misconduct with abuse of power and abusing the trust of the public. We needed to improve board function. There was no doubt about that to better protect the public. And we really knew early on that we needed to improve, improve reporting of physician sexual misconduct to state medical boards because each state board is totally dependent on reporting of misconduct um, in order to do investigations. Our how, our how, how our, our work group um, proceeded, we began with um, uh, an intention to be very grassroots and to be inclusive. We had a work group that included members from 12 state boards that included public members of state boards, physician members, and in executive directors. We spoke many times in big forums to state medical boards in general, um, both investigators, board members, executive directors, again, public members. We heard and invited to our meetings different stakeholders, including representatives from AAMC, AACOM, AMWA, and the osteopathic student medical group. Um, attended one of our met one of our meetings to give testimony. We spoke to survivors of physician sexual misconduct, which was incredibly impactful. They spoke calmly but very um, clearly about the impact on their lives, on on why people do not come forward, on a loss of trust in the medical system a feeling of shame and guilt and somehow that they had brought this on themselves. So it really had an incredible impact on how we looked at this problem and topic. And I would give really recognition to Marissa Hochstetter who is a survivor. Um, she's been um, involved in articles in the New York Times and has put her name forward um, very bravely. Um, in order to make change. We had subject matter experts. We had two on our panel, um, Rebecca Brendel from Harvard, who's an ethicist, and Catherine Caldicott, who's a specialist in physician remediation. We also heard from subject matter experts in trauma, and we um, had our, our um, work group actually go through a trauma-informed um, trauma workshop. And our ultimate goal then was to build consensus. We really, we have 71 different medical boards, 50 states plus the territories, 
a lot of different state laws and different um, ways of doing things, but we needed to build a set of recommendations that could um, support a consensus. So in the next slide were the guiding principles of our report. Um, trust was one, the physician patient relationship is built on trust and this extends to the public's trust in our entire profession. Professionalism, um, the sexual misconduct of any sort between a physician and patient is unacceptable. Fairness, fairness to the victims um, and the, or survivors and fairness also to the physicians, they are afforded due process um, when they are the subject of any complaint before a state medical board. And then finally, transparency. The public has the right to the information about the processes and the basis of regulatory decisions. On the next slide then, we spent a lot of time thinking about um, the definition of sexual misconduct. And really the first bullet here is that we um, ended up with saying that behavior that exploits the physician patient sexual relationship in any sexual way. Um, and we added that uh, this, this was our aspiration that unwelcome sexual behavior toward professional colleagues and also behavior of supervising physicians that inappropriately exploits power dynamics with students or trainees. And on the next um, slide has more um, details on the, our definition. Sexual misconduct can be verbal or physical. It can occur in person or virtual. It's completely devoid of diagnostic or therapeutic qualities or values. And it may include expressions of thoughts and feelings or gestures that are of a sexual nature or that a patient or a surrogate may reasonably construe as sexual. And then the next slide kind of gives a few more points of our definition. We saw that, and Dr. Dubois's work showed us that sexual misconduct exists along a, along a continuum of severity, beginning with potentially acts that would be considered grooming, but special treatment or gifts. It goes to expressions of thoughts and feelings or gestures that are sexual in nature inappropriate physical contact on exam, physical contact that is explicitly sexual, and finally, sexual assault. And we wanted to emphasize that behaviors falling at any point along this spectrum are, worth, are worthy of the attention of state medical boards. Again, um, intervening early is a very important um, aspect of public protection. So on the next slide, I really start our recommendations. The first one was transparency. I've already mentioned this. And um, we knew we could, we should be able to at least improve transparency by clarifying our coding processes. So clearer coding processes, accurate descriptions of behaviors underlying dis discipline, Consistent tech terminology among states because all states use different terms and maximizing reach and impact to the public. So I'm glad to say that we have, we have made some real progress in this through an interprofessional um, committee, including the state boards of nursing, the state boards of pharmacy, the Federation of State Medical Boards and physical therapists. And they have been working with the National Practitioner Data Bank to reduce redundancies, to reduce vague terms, and to um, help make um, more transparent and accurate um, information available to the public. So the next slide actually is a bit of data from, from Dr. Nasser. And I, I put this in, um, I've never used this before, but these are the dates of when um, either legal issues or Michigan State Board issues took place. These were the legal actions. And I put this in just to demonstrate the vagueness in rules or in conclusions of law that, that can be in these legal documents. So he was charged in November of 16 with the sexual violation of the um, gymnast. In January of 2017, following this, the Michigan board suspended his license 
And the basis was that there was no reason provided. So the public, at least for, for, this, for this document was not really informed. In April of 2017, the Michigan board revoked his license and the basis was moral unfitness, unable to practice with reasonable skill and safety. Again, fairly vague terms. In November of 17, he pleaded guilty. In January of 18, he was sentenced. And in April of 18, there was a permanent revocation of his license in Michigan. And at that time, then the basis of the revocation, the conclusions of law were incompetency and conviction of sexual misconduct, moral unfit to morally unfit to practice and negligence. So um, again, just we're, we're trying to improve this and to be more transparent and to make it easier for the public to understand. Fortunately, in Dr. Nasser's case, there was a lot of public awareness and notification through the criminal trials. Um, and that, um, so that was um, a better um, avenue, but the state board should be able to do that also. So the next slide then is our next key recommendations. And I mentioned that um, the boards really act on investigations based on complaints, largely from patients, but also from families, from pharmacists, from other entities. And the board was not getting these complaints. So we knew that we had to provide easily accessible information, education, and clear guidance about how to file a complaint and why these complaints are necessary for effective regulation and safe patient care. Again, early reporting, early complaints. Um, in addition, we knew we had to have, in these cases in particular, frequent communication with complainants throughout the process. Um, we needed to address these complaints as quickly as possible. And we needed to have specially trained complainant liaison or navigator on board staff to help um, these individuals through this process um, to help, you know, have them have trust in the system so they would bring forward um, this information. So the next part also involves getting information to state boards, but this is information that could come from hospitals or other professionals. This would be bystanders, bystanders reporting. Um, this would be what we call, um, what the Federation calls the duty to report when you see misconduct of any type, but, is, but in particular sexual misconduct for the um, application to our report and what the Canadians call duty for candor. So we wanted states to be able to levy fines against institutions for failing to report. Um, we thought that the results of peer review processes in hospitals should be shared with state medical boards when sexual misconduct is involved. That hospitals should be required to report to state boards instances where employed physicians have been dismissed or forced to resign due to concerns with regarding sexual misconduct, and physicians who fail to report known instances of sexual misconduct should be liable for sanction for the breach of their professional duty to report. And physicians and others who do report in good faith should be protected from retaliation and given the option to remain anonymous. So these all seem very reasonable and you might say, well, aren't these happening? And, and there are some glitches in laws um, that allow reporting to go um, under the wire or under the, um, under the view of the state board, so to speak. Um, so we are really looking for hospitals and individuals and other accrediting bodies to step up and report um, these instances. Dr. Cruciani at Drexel had been at Mount Sinai He's a neurologist. He had been at Mount Sinai and then at a hospital in New Jersey. There were many complaints at both of those institutions, but somehow he was allowed to just leave without any reporting to either to the New York State Board or to the New Jersey Board. It was only in Pennsylvania at Drexel that Drexel did their own investigation and then reported to the State Board. So the next slide um, 
shows investigations regarding, um, or key recommendations regarding investigations. Again, um, during the investigation of a complaint against a physician for sexual misconduct, um, if there is a reasonable probability that the physician has engaged in this activity, the state medical board should be able to intervene and temporarily um, suspend the license to ensure the protection of the patient and the public. Um, this also seems reasonable, but in some states, this was not um, allowed and not a law. So this was something we felt was important. Um, likewise, we felt that when a complaint of sexual misconduct is brought forward, that the state board should be able to review previous complaints to identify patterns. And this isn't the case in all states. Um, as I said, the state board should be able to impose interim terms or limitations, including a, a temporary cessation of practice, and that the investigations should involve training in trauma-informed procedures. And this would involve actually not just the investigators, but we felt that the entire board and staff should be aware of the impact of trauma. We spent a lot of time learning about that. And I know that people at UVM have also been speaking to this, um, how this changes memory, how this changes um, your ability to think in a linear way, um, how this changes your ability to come forward um, with complaints. So um, this was an, a really important um, and emphasized part of our recommendations. Um, so the next slide then goes on to um, our key recommendations on discipline. Um, we felt that there were certain forms of unprofessional conduct that should be definitely provide the basis for revocation of a license in order to protect the public. And that you should also consider revocation for repeated um, commission of lesser acts. In the cases where the offense or the misconduct did not mount to uh, a revocation of a license. Um, we really spent a lot of time talking about remediation, that this needed to be appropriate through risk stratification, that it should be detailed and rigorous and have good follow-up with the board over time. And we spent a lot of time talking about practice monitors or chaperones. There are some um, real shortcomings to chaperones when they are people employed by the physicians. Um, so someone who is under a stipulation to have someone present in the office at the same time, we prefer to use the term practice monitor. We thought they should be directly reporting to the state board and um, should really be used only under specific conditions. The next um, slide then just lists some of the considerations we gave for discipline um, in terms of what the patient harm was, the severity, the context of the impropriety, the existence, scope, duration, and nature of termination of the treating relationship, the age, competence, and vulnerability of the patient, the number of times this behavior is occurring, the number of patients, the evaluation and, and assessment of a professional and their recommendation, as well as their assessment of the risk of reoffending. The next slide then talks about our recommendations on, on education. Um, education always seems to be the answer to everything and it's incredibly important. So we put a lot of um, emphasis on this also. Education on professionalism and professional culture education for patients about what to expect during intimate exams. Um, it's just so important along the continuum of medicine, as well as for the public to um, educate and re-educate um, over time to prevent this um, behavior. And then the next, the, our final recommendation was really on culture. Um, Again, across the continuum of medicine from education to practice, 
our goal was to eliminate and contribute in any way to eliminating harassment and building a culture that's supportive of professional behavior and does not tolerate harassment of any type. I just wanted to follow up with a few slides then on the next slide of what um, our state boards, and maybe I'll skip over this one. This is the federation. I've mentioned a lot of those items, but I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about what some of the state boards have done um, in adopting these recommendations. The state of Georgia, um, which, which is the state of the Atlanta Journal, um, really worked hard on making changes. And effective July 1st, 2021 was House Bill 458 that adopted many of our recommendations. Number one was training for board members and staff on sexual misconduct, trauma, and implicit bias, allowing summary suspension of a license pending procedures for revocation or other action. So this is someone under investigation. Um, requiring CME on sexual misconduct and proper examination for all licensed physicians. Um, requiring medical and osteopathic school education on sexual mis misconduct and um, proper examination. And all of their healthcare providers are required to report physicians who have sexually abused patients. And the board is responsible for reporting to the legislature each year on their handling of these cases. The next slide shows some of the, some of the um, things that Ohio has done. Ohio, um, which was the state where Richard Strauss was um, involved with mis sexual misconduct at Ohio State at the, at the um, student clinic there. In 2019, the governor convened a work group to review the investigation of Dr. Strauss, the investigation that the board had done. And that really highlighted some shortcomings of the board at that time. So they began to require attestation on physician license applications regarding duty to report misconduct to the medical board because there were people at Ohio State who had received or were aware of complaints against Richard Strauss that had come into the um, student clinic at the university. And, and this was not forward to the state medical board. In May of 21, licensed physicians are required to complete one hour of CME on the topic of duty to report. And the Ohio board has developed a video course on duty to report sexual misconduct on, and on how to report. And they're doing um, quite a bit of other outreach. I will say that they have actually um, uh, take, um, suspended a license due to um, the um, missed opportunity for duty to report. Um, so they are taking this very seriously. Um, and they're also doing a lot of other great um, changes to improve public protection. So the, and the next slide is on California. California um, has, which has a very, very active um, consumer population, really pushed early on for better information to consumers. And in 2016, California developed a phone app where each, each, in, each citizen of the state or consumer could select up to 16 physicians that they could enter into their phone and they would get alerts on any action regarding those 16 people, including disciplinary actions and other public record actions. In July of 2019, California passed the Patient's Right to Know Act, or it went into effect in July of 19. Um, and this placed um, the licensees placed on probation for serious acts of misconduct are now required to notify patients of their probationary status. So if you call the office for an appointment and someone is on a probationary status, you are notified on the form. And I believe that you then have to sign a, um, uh, a notification um, confirmation of that, um, of that information. And then just, just this month in January, 30, 20, January 2023, um, a new statute um, um, takes effect that um, 
bars the medical board from restoring licenses that have been revoked due to sexual misconduct. And on the next slide are just two other short, um, two other um, short points that have taken place in Florida and then in West Virginia. In Florida, this regards um, uh, a law um, signed into law June 2021, the bars physicians charged with serious crime, such as sexual misconduct, from seeing patients until those charges have been resolved by the legal system. And then in West Virginia in March of 2022, a law that prohibits the medical board from issuing a license to a physician who engaged in sexual activity or other misconduct and whose license was revoked in another state. So um, those are just a sampling, not all of the changes that have taken place, but certainly gratified that the um, state boards are starting to make some movement. We had a bit of a lull because our, our recommendations came out in 2020, just as the pandemic was breaking, but the, but the um, action of state boards and states and legislative changes have really started to move um, over the past year or so. And the last slide is just the um, members of the work group, um, again, thanking um, people who gave a lot of time over two years um, and all of the other people involved that are so numerous. Um, so with that, I thank you for your attention and I'd love to um, answer any questions that you have or um, clarify any issues that maybe I didn't quite make um, clear for you in my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. King, for, for sharing the information with us, but for doing um, this kind of hard work that we really need um, in, our, in our medical culture. Um, I would ask people to either put questions in the chat or feel free to use the raise your hand function and we can call on you. Um, Dean Page, I'll call on you first. Dr. King, thank you so much for this important presentation. Having been faced with um, uh, circumstances in my leadership roles in the past, not in this state that I'll refer to, um, um, I can think of two cases that were almost surreptitiously found, identified, confirmed in settings where they otherwise would not have been made known. And it made me wonder whether we're still seeing the tip of the iceberg here. Do you have any comment on that and how we we can better uh, protect um, uh, individuals, mostly women, who are subjected to which, what is an intolerable uh, risk and, and violation um, for which ideally that would never occur. And I love the idea of getting to people before that this ever happens, but, but my concern is that it is more frequent and how do we do you agree and, and how yeah. do we make sure we address that? Right, I think the, um, some of the, the prevalence or the um, reporting data that I've seen are that really only about 10% of survivors um, for physician sexual misconduct report. I think, and, and that goes along with the reporting for um, sexual, um, assault or attack, um, rape, is actually not, not very high up either. I think certainly, um, and the, the frequency of that, I mean, you, you know the data from, from colleges is surprisingly high, which is a frightening thing. But, but I think you're right, a little bit, a very small percentage is reported. Um, we know that part of that is making people feel comfor comfortable to come forward. Um, and getting the word out that there's a place to go, that it doesn't cost anything to report to the state medical board. You don't need an attorney, you just come forward. Um, but, but building all the support systems for the survivors to be able to come forward and to not, to not feel re-traumatized by the process. Um, you have to meet people on their own terms and in their own time. Um, as they come forward. But then again, the, the reporters, the duty of the profession, the, um, the duty of the hospitals, as well as other um, colleagues to come forward if they have any suspicion. The, we, we really have to change our whole, our whole culture 
um, all across the board that that this is just not not tolerated. Um, and it, it it begins in the medical schools, really. I, I firmly believe that. If you, you know, I, I mentioned, I often mentioned um, uh, Maxine Papadakis's work from UCSF that showed that the professional misconduct in medical school is correlated with um, board actions later on in life in, in practice. So I think the importance of really emphasizing professionalism, um, which, which UVM is doing, but, um, and, and the hospital. The hospitals are interesting because the, the healthcare, I think it's called the Healthcare Quality Insurance Act that was put in place back in the 80s was meant to require hospitals to report um, misconduct or incompetence to state medical boards. But there, there are some loopholes in that. And the one major loophole is that they don't have to report complaints. They only have to report final actions. And those final actions have to be severe enough to have impacted um, your um, credentialing at the hospital for, 30, for at least 30 days. So in the case of Dr. Cruciani, who was at Mount Sinai, then at New Jersey, then at Drexel, there were complaints that the hospitals knew about to my knowledge, and um, he quietly, quietly left um, and, went, and went elsewhere. So it's, um, the hospitals need to step up also. Thank you. We have just a couple of minutes left, um, but I know Dr. Leonard had a question if she wants to unmute herself and ask the question as we wrap up. Hi, Dr. King. I didn't even really think about fairness to physicians um, until you mentioned that. And the, the paper that you cited looking at 101 cases did. So are there false accusations against physicians and what percent does that even represent? Yeah. You know, so that is, that's kind of the he said, she said um, uh, situation. Um, those are always hard, always hard. Um, and um, I think that, at, you know, I, I'm undoubtedly there are some false accusations. I think we um, like to at least be fair, I mean, fair to the physician and the physicians for any complaint there's due process that you have to follow that um, it's, it's a quasi judicial, it's, not, a, it's an, not an absolute judicial, but it's a quasi judicial process to go through the investigation and the, um, and the hearings. Um, but um, we now realize how hard it is for people to come forward and, um, and that the effects of trauma make the stories of the survivors less believable because they don't remember in a linear fashion. And there are some things they don't remember at all. Um, and as Myrna McCollum from University, she's in British Columbia, she works at the University of British Columbia, has done a lot of work with um, the indigenous population and BIPOC population there and trauma. She's an attorney. She readily says that attorneys will play um, to that aspect of memory change and trauma in order to discredit um, the survivors who are bringing cases. So it's um, yeah. I, I guess what I'm talking about is not the um, he said she said or the you know manipulating remembrances or the way people remember who have experienced such traumas, but really. I, I wouldn't think that there are many. No. You know, oh, yeah. Actual false accusations trying to get back at a physician or or something. I I, but you I, did state fairness to the physician, so right. I right. wonder about that. Yeah. No, I do not know of any off the top of my head. I'll try and look into that to see if any if our staff knows of any cases like that. Um, you can, nothing's 100%, so I wouldn't be surprised that there weren't, weren't there, but the, um, but the fairness largely, um, I mean, you have to be fair, um, and um, certainly legally we need to do due process. 
Well, I'm gonna wrap this up as we've just hit um, one o'clock and thank you again, um, Dr. King for joining us. Um, we're so happy to have you in our community and for all the work that you're doing. I also want to give a special shout out to the uh, Gender Equity Steering Committee's Education Working Group, which is Joe Conant, Leanne Holterman, Jennifer Hall, Molly Berry, and Aline Chikoski Kelly, who are dynamos and help put all of this together. Also, thank you to the ODEI um, staff, uh, Tiffany Delaney, Emily Imarino, and Krista Kohler and Kame V, of course, hooray. Um, and I hope that you will think about joining us for our women, um, faculty and staff and students at the Empowerment Self-Defense Workshop February 1st. And then we'll see you at the Celebration of Gender Equity in Medicine and Science, March 2nd. Um, so thank you very much to everyone and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.